going on y'all it's your boy russell the fourth hey everybody it's me brandy and welcome to another episode of the what they never told us podcast what's going on we back <laughs> like we never left <laughs> merry christmas to all everybody yes hope you all enjoy the time with your family or friends that have become like family because we know everybody family ain't y'all know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no but we hope your holiday was everything ours was good i haven't heard your christmas review christmas review uh, how was it busy busy yeah more busy than i like yeah so i have to adjust but i feel like we was going through it a little bit too what do you mean i was sick oh, it's yeah. like a fighting off this cold you had neck your neck was bothering you. My neck, my feet, my whole body was sore yesterday. It was, yeah, it was, it rough. was tragic. It was and rough. it's cold. It's like brick cold outside. I never knew what that meant, but I think I feel what they say. All I, the I words. I don't know what to describe it, but like brick sounds good. Everything makes sense. The hawk <laughs> <It's> was out. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that one? Yeah, the hawk out. And my grandpa used to say it's colder than a witch's titty outside. All, All of that. that. Everything <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> That with the, it's brick outside. That's exactly how it felt like you got hit with some bricks as soon as you step out. Yeah, over here in Mid, in our part of Michigan, it was one degree on Friday. Yes. Then it was zero degrees on, on Saturday. There's no degree of temperature yeah. at all. <laughs> it was it was rough. And Yesterday it wasn't too bad. It was like that, you know, that sludgy stuff when you're driving, and it was pretty much all ice. Not as bad as Seattle though. Yeah. But I had a great time watching those videos on TikTok. Are oh, people slipping people, on ice? Oh, man, it was hilarious. <laughs> so they got an ice storm over there. Oh, my goodness. Funniest thing I've seen on TikTok in a while. I don't care what you say. Somebody slipping on the ice is, will forever be funny. Not just slipping, falling, period. If you fall in front of me, I'm going to laugh. I'm got, just one of them people. Yeah, my mom slipped on the ice on, on the way to church one day, and it was one of the most trouble I ever got to, and it got worse because I could not stop laughing. <laughs> That's my mom. My mom like fell under the car. She tried to get out, hit that patch of ice, and like sucked her under the car. Hollered. I don't care, <laughs> Mama or not. You all right? We yeah, we was at the hospital too. So if she hurt herself, we was in the right place. So I definitely laughed. I laugh, laugh. Yeah, oh, <laughs> it, it, it will forever be funny. It's always gonna be funny. Yeah, bad stuff. <laughs> Even my kids, they when they fall, crack up. You be running. Is you okay? No, she hit her head for real. She all right? It was still funny. I ain't never seen your children sleep on ice. I'm not talking about sleeping. I said falling in general. Oh yeah, you fall is funny to me. <laughs> okay. It's also funny when I fall. So. Nah, you be like you be so extra when you fall. You make sure no one can laugh. What do you mean? You be so. <sighs> you're very extra when you fall. It seems like when I fall, I always hit my shin on something. Though. When you injure yourself in general, you you're very extra. So laughing seems just cruel when the way you fall. And I think it's purposeful Psychological too. Psychological warfare. Yeah, I know. What you, I see what you want. I see what you're doing. Next time, I'm gonna have no mercy. Something really gonna be wrong too. I'm gonna be rolling. I see how you do. Anyway, you had something to say. Stop drinking your coffee. Tell the folks what you had to say. I have nothing to say. What are you talking about? I literally thought that you were gonna talk about something before we started. Oh shoot! Yes, I do. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Hey, look. So. We're planning for our next episode, um, and I think we've mentioned it, mentioned it on a live before, but this is an actual... What you laughing at? That was like 30 minutes ago. We done did a lot of stuff in between when I mentioned it to you. Anyways, um, listen, we want to do... A, not even a segment. We're doing an entire episode... Um, Based on the idea we had called Ask R&B, right? So we want you guys to submit anonymous talking points, right? It could be real life experience. We actually had uh, one of our faithfuls write to us this morning about a topic that's, um, you know, something that she's dealing with. And we want to kick it about that. But we want to talk about everything. We pray um, before every recording session that we touch on something that is relevant and speaks to everybody's situation. But this one, we don't even want to just, you know, we're, go we're going to let God put it on your hearts to give us specifically what you want to talk about um, concerning your life. So uh, 
Please submit all topics, all talking points, anything you want. Feedback on to what they never told us pod at gmail.com. Once again, that's what they never told us pod at gmail.com. You should see it down here right now. Or any of our social media platforms. Absolutely. You can feel free to inbox us. Absolutely. Anywhere you see us, hit us up. Looking forward to that. And that's all I got. Well, anyways, what I wanted to talk about kind of leads into that because I got asked a piece of advice. Um, and it made me think of a central theme, right? So let's say you have a friend and you know something about this friend, like something about their life. Let's say maybe their spouse or their significant other um, that could be detrimental to their relationship. Do you believe that you should tell them? Who's my, who's the person I'm connected to? Am I connected to? You're co- the 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 person that could be being done wrong. Oh yeah, I'm saying something. Well, it it depends. It there's a lot of variables. It depends on who the person is, what's their emotional intelligence, the type of person they are. Because if I tell you, it, you know what? No, I'm gonna say something. <laughs> so this this it it seemed relevant to us because we had this conversation a week into us like reacquainting and talking maybe two weeks into Mm -hmm. this, you came to me and asked, you said, you gave me the scenario, you played it out for me and said, do I say something? And my advice to you was absolutely not. You do not say anything. So you've changed on that. No. um, I was open to counsel and feedback um, based on that scenario. But I think I'm more hardwired just baseline to, try and help um i think that situation had some specifics that made me more open to like okay maybe it's not the best space to say something this really doesn't concern me and the relevancy of the information i had didn't seem poignant uh, Mm -hmm. poignant poignant what's the word poignant say it again poignant oh poignant it's the glasses (laughs) made it poignant so i just it didn't feel relevant at the time the information seemed like it would be more hurtful than useful. So I was like, you know what? I, I hear that. And I so you that. have to weigh all of those factors. All those factors for sure. But if if I'm if I know somebody and they're a friend and there's something going on right now that could be harmful to them present tense. Not harmful like to their hurtful. physical self. Yeah. No. Yeah. Just hurtful emotionally. Yeah. I'm gonna say something. So like, you wanna deliver the hurtful information. I don't want to be the person, but I'm not going to let him be in the dark. If my best friend's wife is cheating on him, you think I'm going to just look him in the face every day knowing that? Just like, it ain't my business. So I'm do saying you have something. to have a level of proof before you would nah. say? I mean, what do you mean? How do I know? I'm I mean, not gonna you, might, tr- you might be suspicious. Or maybe you heard a rumor. Nah, I wouldn't do that. I'm not. Hearsay is different. So nah. you have to have If I'm out with proof. you and I see my best friend's wife on a date with another man, <laughs> I'm going to say, yo, I don't know if you know what's up, but. I was at the movies and I saw your wife there with some dude. I'm saying something. So for me, I there's no like I tend to not try to give unsolicited advice to anyone. And I think the same way as bad news. Because if if it were me in that situation, especially if you have no proof, I don't want you coming to me and planting thoughts in my head that may not be true. I saw that. You saw her? I saw her. <laughs> no, I'm saying in the in the scenario, you don't have proof. Because a oh, lot okay. of times Here's we saying. will have these conversations with our friends because we feel something. Or yeah. maybe we can see something that you can't see because you're so in love. And yeah. we're like, yeah, nah, sis, that don't add up. Or bro, nah, she lying. Like, I was over there and that didn't happen. Or, you know, something. Yeah. Um, But I've had that backfire on me in too many situations that personally – Unless you come in to me and be like, what do you think about this? And I already have feelings, then I will voice that. But I just, I am not with coming to somebody with unsolicited advice. So that was the advice that I gave to the person. Like, if you don't have any tangible proof, you can't really go out and just insert yourself in a situation hoping that what they do what with it. Because then when you give that information, is it your hope or your wish or your thought that they would, get out of that potentially harmful situation nah i'm not coming in you're just with, trying to inform them i'm not coming in with no you should do this i'm just coming in with hey this is what i know 
And now, granted, in my scenario, I know. I saw you. I caught. I saw proof. Um, I'm just coming with information. What you do from there is what you do from there. But I'm not. So the pur- what's the <sighs> purpose behind that of telling them just so they're informed? You're my friend. You think I, I don't? I'm I'm never going to see my friend being done wrong, and I just sit back, smile in their face. Because on the flip, if they find out I knew the whole time. <laughs> it's a lose lose situation. It's not a lose lose situation. I don't. If you're a friend of mine and you don't value me trying to help, then you're not a friend of mine. If because yeah. I'm gonna tell you what, if somebody see you cutting up on me, <laughs> you better tell me. And you would just believe them. If they sh- if they said I saw a text message and Brandy was texting my friend, I saw their text thread. They got something going on, and. Yeah, it depends who my friend was. Like, if it's you gonna go confront me about something that somebody told you, you have no suspicion yourself. But because somebody told you, you gonna come try to confront me, that's not gonna go well for us. Okay, you think I'm just, they're just gonna tell me that I'm just gonna ignore it? Hmm, I trust her. I'm not gonna say anything. No, no, I think I think you take that information if that's the case. Yeah, and you want to be that you take that information and you try to make that connect. But I'm not doing none of that. I'm gonna come ask you. That's what we do. Hey. Somebody came to me with this information. They said they saw a text thread between you and this dude. What's going on? Now, if Nothing. you. All right. Well, then now it's on me to trust and believe that. But I'm not going to just ignore things under the guise of I trust you. No, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to communicate. This is what I heard. This is what's being told to me. What say you? That's dangerous. What do you mean? That's how is that dangerous? I people just, do dirty stuff. People at, cheat. At, no, people do do dirty stuff on both sides, right? Yeah. There are people who just want to destroy a happy household. They're miserable. That's why you so just ask. I, how would you I get mad know. if someone asking? I, I don't know if mad is necessarily the word that I would use, but I would definitely be offended if we're just like we are today and then you went to target and you saw somebody and they said oh yeah i think she talked to my boy i didn't know that was your wife you come back and try to confront me about that that's a random scenario (laughs) that's like Uh, in my scenario there's proof so if somebody comes to me and tells me they saw you with another guy at a function you just expect me not to say anything and say oh no she would never yeah i do (laughs) <laughs> You're wrong. I'm gonna say so. Be fitted if you want to. Hey, what's up? You know me. <laughs> Where have I gone without you? Huh? Yeah, you were supposed to be like, nah. I would definitely be shocked. I'm like, what? <laughs> huh? How? That don't even make sense, bro. I'm gonna still That's say not something. my not Brandy. If you tell me no, I believe you. But I'm gonna ask. What I look like just ignoring stuff. That don't even. How how is that beneficial? Gotta, I don't get it. It gotta make sense. Nah, but so um. <laughs> It, it also happened so another just a few days ago so what about this scenario friends living a a, a a life excuse me less ideal than what you believe is it your is it your place to insert and say something like you shouldn't be doing that i wouldn't say it like this that this scenario <laughs> isn't good for you i wouldn't say it like that um but that's, I don't know. That's just who I am as a person. And I think it has something specifically to do with how God made me. But the people in my life, I've never been silent about, <clears throat> um, you know, things that I feel like could be harmful. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't have to be right. I could be very wrong. But it's my job as a friend to tell you what I feel. You know what I mean? Whether you ask me or not. You know what I mean? And honestly, mm-hmm. it's changed dynamics. I've had friends for a lifetime that the dynamic has shifted because – I was vocal about um, a life they were living. You know what I'm saying? And they're still friends that I have to this day. And I think the reason why those friendships last is because they they know. Like, to me, the people who always loved me the most were the ones who always held me accountable. They're not the ones who just stood there like, well, it's not my business, so I ain't going to say nothing. And in the mean in between time, I'm being I'm I'm living a self-destructive life and you're just sitting there on the front row watching it. Say something to me. <laughs> yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the maturity level of the people in your life. And I just thought it was relevant because in this scenario where we do get on this platform and talk about many different things, um it has opened up a door. Okay. So like we're asking for questions. People just come to us unsolicited and say, "Hey, I'm dealing with this." what do you think and for me 
I have not always been the best at delivering information with the softest blow. Like I am very blunt and sometimes to a point where it can be hurtful to people yeah. and people come to still come to us for advice. And I'm struggling with providing information in a way that still, you know, makes people want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> because I am very opinionated and I do feel like God has gifted me with a certain level of wisdom and discernment in specific areas, especially as it pertains to things that I've been through before. <laughs> and so when you come to me for advice, like I'm going to be very honest and truthful with that. And I've just seen it ruin relationships and I still take the stance of I'm never going to just come to you and be like, yo, that's not okay. Like, you should change that. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm feeling a little conflicted when people come to me for advice. This is like where, and I, I, I see a perspective, mm -hmm. right? Not knowing you <laughs> and <laughs> being on the out. receiving <laughs> end of, uh, you know, some constructive your, criticism. Your style of, con you know, communication. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, I think, number one, that's incredibly insightful and vulnerable. You'd even, like, share that. So that's dope, one. But two, like, ultimately, um, I think the heart behind wanting to say those things is pure, right? It just comes from Absolutely. a loving place. And I think the fact that you can even assess, like, okay, I know this ain't my strength. <laughs> Like, well, I ain't coming to nobody <laughs> as a woman. Um, <laughs> you know, but ultimately, like, um, I think it's worth sharpening that skill set, right? Because that's that's can be a learned thing. I think, I think your your predisposition or mm -hmm. your you know your kind of factory settings for how you communicate are necessary for who you are and what you're supposed to yeah. do in this earth, right? And I try to brace people, like, look. If you're going to ask me, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes they don't ask, right? Sometimes, yeah, that's you know, the gotcha get you. that's, that's the, the gotcha right get you, right? Like sometimes they don't ask. Sometimes you're just, they're just crashing their car in front of you. They're stone cold drunk and they're driving home by themselves, mm -hmm. right? And a good friend doesn't say, well, ain't none of my business. A good friend says, give me your car keys. <laughs> I don't want to have to choke you out to get your car keys, but you're not finna die because you think you're not drunk enough. Yeah. You know? I know it's an example, but physically harmful things, I do think I have a, oh, I have a grasp on that because I have a, I fit people who I'm close up on who have problems with substances. Now watch this. And, <laughs> what? I think spiritually. I know. You know what I'm saying? I get I it. think the spiritual side mm -hmm. has far greater consequences than the physical you yeah, can lose a I leg and still live a fruitful life mm -hmm. but your soul you lose that Whew, that's it's hard to come back from you know what i mean so um i see where you're coming from i see where you're coming <laughs> from but i've always i've it's it's i can't i've tried you know what i mean i have people family extremely close to me that i've literally talked to myself like just don't say nothing just don't say nothing and it's literally, I've become, I've had, f uh, like, physical responses to trying not to say something. Stomach hurting, headaches, sweating. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. hold on. <laughs> but, but you know that that doesn't mean that every time you feel something or you think something, you have to say it. It's just in the in the situation where you feel convicted to say something. I feel like when it's con when I'm convicted like that, to yeah. that degree, it's mm. because I'm supposed to say something. Right, that's what I'm, I'm saying. But it's it. just not like, if you don't agree with the way somebody's living their life, that doesn't open you up no, to No, yeah. no, no. And there's okay. a difference between my personal idea of how someone should live their life versus just standard. This would be wrong for anybody. This, would, this isn't good for anybody. Not mm -hmm. just my idea of you, but just in general. You know what I'm saying? Like... In this, I know we keep using the driving home drunk scenario, but just like seeing that and us just having a baseline understanding of, yo, that's just not safe to do. There's enough information on this to where mm -hmm. we can see that this is not safe, right? Um, there are certain things spiritually that I think fall under that same category. Like I've seen enough evidence to know like this isn't good for anybody. You know what I mean? So that's more of my drive to do it. And like I said, like, I'm not blunt like you. I think I deliver things with a lot more. Hey, look, 
this is just what I'm saying. If I'm wrong, just tell me to shut up and I will. But I'm not a good friend if I don't tell you this. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm seeing. And from what I know about you, it seems different. It seems like this is a far cry from what I know about you. And if you're going through something, like I'm your friend. I don't want to just be here and watch you self-destruct. But give me, shed some light on this. What's going on? You yeah. know what I mean? Like that's how I communicate that. I don't just jump in like, hey, look, um, you doing this and you doing that and you know you dead wrong. Because that is like, I don't, I just, that's just not my flow. But yeah, I, I, can, ten, I yeah. tend to, my, my methods thus far have been to like pick up, not pick apart, but kind of probe, ask probing questions to get the person yeah. there themselves. So I, I recall very strongly um, when we first started dating and it was really on my heart to check the, your spiritual temperature. Where were you at? Yeah. And the things that I knew, who I knew you from before to be versus what you had told me your life had been yeah. for the last couple of years. And I remember specifically being like, hey, yo, why are you running? You know what I'm saying? Like, you ain't say it like that. <laughs> I, I pretty much did. I did. You did I literally was like, I said, do you, do you, you're not in, so you're not going to church. Yeah. And you were like, no. And I was like, well, like I thought you were a minister. Mm-hmm. And you was like, yeah, well, I kind of stepped right back from that. I started telling me about this little journey that you had, not little journey, but the journey that you had been on. And I literally was like, why are you running? Yeah. For sure. Your tone was so sweet. Though. It you was know? not sweet. It was so sweet. <laughs> and maybe I was just it only felt sweet for Maybe me. I just smitten at the time, but everything you said felt like, oh. Um, she can. <laughs> <laughs> this is really um, on time, and I'm glad you kind of went into that because um, a homie hit me up yesterday, and I talked to him about this. I texted him and mm-hmm. asked him for his blessing. Um, and I, uh, thanks to your advice, I sent him the screenshot. Um, of our topics list me and Brandy got a shared note where we just if we have something that we feel like could be a good talking point we mm-hmm, just throw it on the list mm-hmm. so we don't forget it um season two she came up with this come to Jesus moment right and he blew me off yeah I was like yo we a relationship <laughs> podcast like yo I don't know if this is really the space for that you know meanwhile all of our platform is built on just uh, our faith talking about that and almost every episode it comes up somehow <laughs> so um Brady had a fourth thought but I do think it was for such a time as this I think it was very purpose that it wasn't the time to release that you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying um I think God wanted to build it up a little more get a little more ears you know on the podcast so I, it does seem very timely, but he literally hit me up and was like, yo, fam, like, what do you think about a come to Jesus moment? He literally said that. Mm-hmm. He said, do you think that that has to happen for somebody to, you know, recommit their life or start changing the way they move concerning their relationship with God? Do you think they need to have a come to Jesus moment? And I wasn't thinking about this episode at the time. I was just kicking it with him. You know what I mean? We was mm-hmm. chopping it up. But as soon as we hung up the phone, I just it just hit me like wow this is something that we've been talking about talking about since season since before season two yeah you know what I mean I think so for those of you who are um, faithful listeners and listen to the last kickback episode um, just randomly as God does out of nowhere somebody pops on our YouTube and ask a very specific question just about not having friends and being lonely. And um, we talked about the sort of isolation period that God sometimes takes you through. And then for the, our friend to come and then ask that question and use those very specific phrases. When you said it in the car, like, yeah, he asked, you know, if we, if everybody has a come to Jesus moment for me, it was an instant connection to like, it's time release it. (laughs) And it's crazy because I don't know why I was so apprehensive about in season two, but like literally every thing that we've done concerning our faith, God automatically puts a huge spotlight on it. You know what I'm saying? Like I remember, you know, the, for those of you guys familiar with like our, our content like on my TikTok and on my IG you know we do these like inspirational words right 
and it's always the ones that are about God that I'm like, you know what? I know people aren't gonna receive this. I know people aren't gonna like this. But I'm just gonna be obedient and do it. And those those will be the ones that like take off. Mm-hmm. I remember I did the whale theory and I was like, you know what? I know I'm only going to get like 20 likes and that's cool with me because it ain't about the likes. It's about being obedient. And then you call, you were the first one to hit me and was like, babe, this the one I'm telling you right now. This the one right here. I almost shouted. And I said, oh, all right, my, my girl like it. That's all I need. And then next thing you know, my phone just, and I was like, wow, like, okay, God, I see you. Like, this needs to be said. Mm-hmm. This needs to be a conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, So you touched on something right there. I, I'm sorry to, take the conversation down that winding road but you 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 said something right when we first reconnected and mm-hmm. you were kind of assessed like okay let me do a temperature check on where his faith is at like we still have i think at that point you would assess we had a connection absolutely like okay we feel things still there's a connection but i'm not moving forward <laughs> <laughs> he ain't right spiritually <laughs> or trying to get right because sanctification is a process for everybody I can't say like I was in this place and you needed to meet me there or this wasn't going to happen or you needed to already be there or it wasn't going to happen like but is is you interested what do you know about yeah. this Jesus and how are you trying to <laughs> find your way back I want to I want to shed some light on where I was at at that time mm-hmm. but before I do that I want you to tell tell me why was that important like because a lot of people Ooh. yeah a lot of people they just if if they feel something mm-hmm. there's a, a a vibe there's a <laughs> there's a connection <laughs> they make you feel things they'll say we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that down the road you know I, it was important to me because y- your faith to me is the only thing that can't be manufactured. Mm. I can manufacture a vibe. I can manufacture attraction and feelings and lust. All those things can, can, you know, we can do things to mimic them and make them feel real. But that for me was the first real thing that I had felt in a very long time. A fo- the foundation and the peace that I had with with God it was unmatched and there was absolutely no way that I was going to tie myself to someone who was not trying to be in that same place because I knew that if I was going one way and the person that I chose to be with was going the exact opposite way one or two things is going to happen. I was going to have to do everything I had, take everything I had and try to pull you up with me and convince you that this is where you need to go or you were going to take me and pull me away. And what I really wanted to do was just both us decide that this is the direction that we're going separately, then get together and take off. So sure. for me, it wasn't just like an important thing. It was the only thing. Okay. So... Um, for me, let me get some background. So she said what she knew about me uh, prior to us reconnecting, like what she knew about me from when we were kids. And for those of you guys that are familiar with the platform, we've talked about this before. Growing up, I was the quote unquote church boy, right? I was saying quote unquote. That's what you was. <laughs> <laughs> well, nah, because I, I still was on some nonsense back then. Like, I mean, not compared to other people. But, okay. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, so I grew up in church. Um, I remember it was maybe third grade. We went to vacation Bible school at this church here and we hadn't, I hadn't been going to church, Mm -hmm. um, but I felt a pulling. They, they did the invitation to, Hey, does anybody want to, you know, join the church? Anybody want to get to know this Jesus that I talked about? And next thing I know, I was in the aisle and my mama was like, what are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing? Just visiting. And I was just like, (laughs) like, I'm I'm walking up. He said, come, I'm coming. So, um, since then, uh, first it was just me and my mom going to church. Eventually it was me and my mom and my sister going. And then eventually my dad came, Mm -hmm. the, the family joined the church. Um, but I just remember having an experience then like this is what I'm supposed to be doing Mm -hmm. Um, I can't say I walked around in school and which I never know I got the like church boy thing because I wasn't walking I know people who literally would walk around with the bible in hand I had friends who would walk around school with bibles Mm -hmm. like I I was in school I was cussing I was in the mix with everybody like I wasn't like hey y'all man y'all need to get to know Jesus I wasn't I wasn't out here like that 
So I don't know what made you give me like what made people see me like that. Your dad was a deacon. You were always at church. All of your like activities seemed to center around that. And I don't think necessarily for me, church boy was the I mean, it was, but it wasn't. But you were just a good guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. you know, we we knew that you went to church every Sunday. We knew that you were a staple fixture at LBC, you know, like that was a church. <laughs> Not Long Beach, California, <laughs> Lily Baptist church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was y'all like for, for a time, your whole friend group crew, yeah. were the poster boys for the church. So like, you know, y'all were synonymous with that church. Okay. So you just kind of got that. I get it. So, um, I felt a strong push. I'll, I'm summarizing. I put. I felt a strong push on my life from the third grade that there was something on me spiritually. Like I never was forced to go to church. I chose church mm-hmm. as a child. Um, I've never been able to just sit in a service and just be there. I'm always called to the front. Mm-hmm. You was witness to that. I had been to church years. I came to church with you, and you was like. Uh, uh, Russell come up and say something When mm-hmm, I came to visit mm-hmm. your church That's been my entire experience Since a child mm-hmm. Fourth grade Little Russell come up here and say something <laughs> What? What do you mean say something? You know big crowd of people Um, So I've always felt a calling on my life Didn't know for what Until I was 18 18 I accepted my call to preach Um, I won't give a long, long story Short I started preaching at 18 um, live my life the way I thought I was supposed to go um, But My faith Was just something I was like supposed to do Right like you go to church You do that I can't say I ever made a decision That I'm living my life For God Yeah. In my mind I'm a, I'm a, I go to church mm-hmm. this is what I do I'm a good guy I do good things And this is what you do when you're good <laughs> Right. It was a very surface level idea of living your life for God mm-hmm. um, When your foundation isn't strong Which mine wasn't When I went through Trauma Traumatic situations My divorce was kind of my Catalyst for this It rocked my foundation And my house fell Right mm-hmm. And after that I said man you know what I've done all these things Quote unquote The right way And It didn't work out Got me here You know what I'm saying I abstained to marriage Got in my marriage And it ain't clicking The way it's supposed to click You know what I'm gonna live life (laughs) I said you know I'm gonna lean on my own Understanding (laughs) I'm gonna live life So after my uh, Divorce After my separation I just You know Threw caution to the wind And I wasn't out here like that But I definitely was um, Having sex I was Drinking I was smoking weed You know The stuff we all do a lot of people do <laughs> uh, So that was at the point when I reconnected with Brandy There was a lot of stuff that happened in between that But for the sake of not talking everyone's ears off Long story short that's when I Reconnected with Brandy Yeah and so just like I said it was It was a A stark difference from the person That I knew like I know you said You were cussing in high school but I rarely Remember hearing you you know like Use profanity so For it to be like sprinkled into (sighs) Everyday conversation It just felt yeah it was more like Sports no 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 I'm saying Like when we were when we reconnected Oh yeah it just felt Different you know what I'm saying And for me I was like I'm not going to judge you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to tell you how to live your life, but like, you know who you are. I know who you are. So like, yeah. why are we not here? Because for me, the journey was completely different. I was about to say, well, <laughs> like let, the, the, I said, we need to talk about your journey because <laughs> who you were when we reconnected That's what, was different. Yeah. <laughs> the journey was, it was, it was completely different for me. So um, I had a staple in my family of faith. So, like, instead of running to God when you had questions, you just went to your grandma and she talked to God. And that's just how it was. Um, My mama didn't go to church. My aunts, some of them went to church, but then they would backslide and then they would be, like, totally on the other end of it. None of my uncles ever went to church. And my grandpa was like, what is church? So, (laughs) for me, I just grew up with my grandma being the connection, right? And um, I wasn't even... 
baptized. Like it was something that I used to be ashamed of because even my friends, even who weren't living the life when I was growing up, like they weren't Christians at all, but they had been baptized like what their family did when they were younger. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got baptized. I'd never been baptized. I never even got introduced to the thought of it. Right. Um, until 2019 was when I got baptized. And in that I had this recognition that I was glad that my mom never made me do that because I did know a lot of people who grew up in church and grew up, you know, with church being the center of their, of their life and their family. And a lot of them had gone astray and I never could make the connection of why that was happening. But, um, it was through a conversation with you and I where, where you were saying like, I, it was just never my choice. It was just something that we did in 2019. It was my choice. And it was my choice after living a life of just trying to do things that felt good in hopes that it would complete me. Being with men, having a baby, chasing money, chasing notoriety, you know, just chasing things, hoping that one of those things would give me the feeling of peace and completeness. And none of them did. So by the time 2019 rolled around and somebody invited me to church, I had literally tried everything. Drinking, drugs, sex, money, men, not women, but (laughs) just everything to try to be happy. And I didn't find that immediately when I went to church. But what I did is I found hope. And once I found hope, I was like, I will do anything to hold on to this feeling right here. Because for me at that time, it was personal. It wasn't nobody making me doing it. It was like God had specifically came down to me on the road at church and was like, I've been waiting on you. Yeah. And that feeling of just belonging, not to a church, but to his family. Like he wanted me. He took me out of all that stuff that I was in and placed me right here to come personally speak to me. That was nobody, a feeling no, had, that has not been matched by anybody or anything. Yeah. And I was not willing to let that go. And the relationship that I was in had to be able to be there in that role, wherever that role was with me and willing to have that same conversation with God as he led us to wherever we were going. For sure. For sure, it's it's interesting you brought up the um the aspect of choosing, mm-hmm. right? Because in my scenario, like I chose it. No one made me. You mm-hmm. know, what I mean, if anything, they were surprised. What are you doing? Like, I chose that. I chose to be baptized. But I think what a lot of people do, and it's not just kids who grew up in church. People in general, like they have this idea of, you know, what I want to get closer to God. Mm-hmm. I wanna, I wanna get saved. I wanna do this right. You know what I mean? But they don't know what that means. They think that when I give my life to God, that means I go to church, Mm -hmm. which is such a minuscule, small part of what it means to live your life for God. Mm -hmm. It's not the building that you show up to on Sundays, right? So I chose that but didn't know what it meant, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So I grew up in this Christian system, this church system, this mm-hmm. culture of church. Um, but there's a difference between being immersed in church and being immersed in God, Absolutely. in Christ, right? So Absolutely. it wasn't until <clears throat> 2020 when we, re- when we reconnected that I had an opportunity to choose God with a better understanding of what that actually means. I was going to say that that foundation that you talk about and that you set is why a lot of people actually run away from God because we take church and that system and put it in the place of God. Right. And so we get church hurt because we allow people to represent something that they could never even touch, right? Yeah. We hold them with such esteem. You're a pastor. You're a first lady. You're a deaconess. You're an evangelist. And then we see them do something that doesn't equal God. What? We, yeah, right. And we're like, oh, well, wait a minute. 
that messes with my idea of what this is all about. Absolutely. What do you mean he cheated? What do you mean she had a baby by somebody else? What do else? you mean he stole? Yeah, what do you mean yeah. he's lying, you know? And then when I see people who we've been told God put them in that place, right? Well, if God put you in that place, then how would he let you do X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. And we forget that people are just people. Absolutely. Right? God is the only one. Yeah. <laughs> and and that that thing drives a wedge between us and God. And so I was very thankful that I hadn't had the chance to get have that happen to me, right? Yeah. So I walked into it kind of with a, a different perspective. Like I didn't walk into it thinking that this is going to be perfect because I had seen so much not perfect stuff. I knew what life was. I knew life was not going to be pretty and be nice because from the time I could recognize what I was doing, you know, I've had to fight obstacles. You were blessed too, though, because when you came in, you came I into a, a fire place, church family. A great place. Because it's a vulnerable space, right? Like in the beginning of that, you if you would have been in a building or a church community with harmful people. Oh, absolutely. It would have ruined me. It would have ruined you. I would have fled in the other direction. <laughs> and this is why, like, it's become such a sore spot for me. Like, they, I saw a post, I think just as close, like two weeks ago. And it was like, hey, for y'all new generation, like, why why y'all stop going to church? In the thread, it had been shared like 80,000 times. And I'm just going through, I'm reading comments, I'm reading comments. I must have read like 100 comments. And it was all about people. Every single thing that had to do about people not going to church had to do with the people in the church mm -hmm. every single thing right so number one yes it's a flawed idea for you to look at the flaws of humans and let that be an indicator on your relationship with god right of course god moves through the people right mm -hmm. he uses people but he is not the people Right. So the things that people have done to you are not an indication of who God is to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, it's important for people who are in that role or position. Are in that role, mm -hmm. like that position, it's so consequential. I've always respected that. Like for me, when I felt myself slipping, that pulpit got more and more uncomfortable mm -hmm. it was just as sensitive as this because i was preaching multiple times a month mm -hmm. at the same church in front of everybody the pastor was grooming me to be the next pastor uh, one of the largest churches in the city mm -hmm. hey i'm telling you now this is your next pastor in front of everybody now for me most, for most people, that's like, ooh. Especially people like me who are who don't mind being in front of people, mm -hmm. who want to use their gifts well. But for me, it was terrifying because I understand the weight of what that is. I know what it means for somebody to wear that title. Now everything you do is under scrutiny. Now everything you say has an extra weight. Now when you say something hurts somebody's feelings, it's not you hurting their feelings, it's the church hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when my marriage started feeling like there was no hope, when I started losing faith in that, I had a hard time going in the pool for some people to believe. Mm -hmm. When I didn't believe God to fix my marriage, what I looked like coming in here preaching, y'all just got to believe, have faith. God can do anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but in my own life, I'm like, nope. God retreat. Can't fix this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's over. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Especially in the the system I grew up in, which was mad old school church. Divorce is not a thing. We mm -hmm. don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you're in a marriage, you stick in it and just be unhappy. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I I'm like, I can't stay here. Cause if I stay here, I'm gonna keep getting called into this pulpit. Mm -hmm. And I can't keep going in this pulpit because my life does not reflect what I'm supposed to be saying from this microphone. Mm -hmm. And if it don't, I'm not on the microphone. Yeah, That's how serious I take that. I don't want nobody looking at my life and saying, I told you God isn't real. Look at him. 
and and <laughs> I think every position in church or out of church, but you should have that reverence, right? That it if you are put in a position to serve people, that it's never about you, right? So you have to govern yourself accordingly, so that when people are coming, they feel welcome, number one, and then they feel like it's real. Yeah. So you show that it's real by living your life that is like it's real. Mm-hmm. So I understand that conflict. Um, I also know that even though I was welcomed into a great church, when you're not the picture of perfection as the person walking in, the scrutiny that is placed on you as the one who is unclean, the one who is damaged, the one who is broken, the one who has no church history and you're coming and you're looking for that. And the church as a whole has a standard of what a Christian is. And you don't feel like that. You don't look like that. You don't talk like that. It's hard. Right. And so if the people in there aren't welcoming enough or you see what you're trying to fix in yourself, you see that reflected in people it makes it hard. So I won't ever sit here and lie and say that I walked in the church and yes, God met me there. And he did. He sat down and he talked to me, but I still had to deal with what it meant for me as a person who had no church history, who had no real concept of what it looks like and who didn't come from a complete family, who was a, a single mom. Now I was a teenage mother I was now getting divorced you know all the things that Christians aren't supposed to be I'm coming in as that and now I want to be something new and I thank God for where he did place me but I would be lying if I didn't say that it's still not hard to adjust into that lifestyle when the picture of Christianity is something that we paint to be perfection I think it's changing. I really hope so. <laughs> I really, I really, and this is what I love about what's happening in uh, the new generation of church, mm-hmm. right? Like, I remember at one point seeing a preacher with a tattoo uh, yeah. would be like, oh my God. He's radical. He's radical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's not of God, mm-hmm. right? Like, I remember I got chewed out because I tried to wear jeans to a youth service. Mm. <laughs> like, what you mean you wearing jeans in the church, right? Um, but now I can go into church and see someone in the choir with pink hair, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, with a nose ring, mm-hmm. right? Like, this new generation of church is getting less and less concerned about the aesthetic of Christianity and more and more concerned with the authenticity of your relationship with God. And I think that's dope. I think that's insanely dope. And honestly, I think that I can't speak for the people and I hope that, but I hope that they will say that that's what draws them to us. Right. Because what we've never come here and tried to do is paint this picture of we're this perfect Christian couple. Right. But I think that through the, the, just the air of what we talk about and the way that we try to live our lives, that it speaks louder, even if it doesn't look like what you thought, even if it doesn't talk about the things that you thought it would talk about, yeah. like the fact that you don't have to be this cookie cutter version of a person to be accepted and be loved by God. And for me, that was it. I got into a place where that taught me that, right? Right. Nah, my pastor is divorced. What? What do you mean? How is he a pastor and he's divorced? Yeah. For me, being in a church with people who went through the things that I went through, especially at the head of it, is what pulled me in. So for us, I think we try to be that, right? Like, hey, we're going to talk about the stuff that we went through and where we are so that you can see that you're not excluded from that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not shying away from anything. I I really, as much as I know it wasn't God's will for me to make the mistakes that I did, I do know that he's a redeemer. 
And I do know that he uses everything and none, no experience is wasted. Mm -hmm. And I think what he's done with my unique situation is equip me to speak to things that I never could speak to before. Yeah. Like I could speak all day about, you know, you know, you don't need to drink. God is all you need. But until I've experienced it, now my oil speaking to that is completely different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I don't I really I really want people to understand like there is no building that you can walk into. There's no person that you can talk to that is free or that is exempt of flaw. Like it's it's impossible, right? But nobody would walk into a hospital, right? And if you saw a nurse who was who was sick, right? No one would say, I can't go to the hospital. Look, the nurses, the look, the nurse got cancer. Mm -hmm. This hospital can't be no good. <laughs> like, no, because that happens to everybody because we're human beings in flawed vessels. Sickness happens, right? You think the surgeon don't get sick? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's the same thing in church. Like, sin is in the world, right? Like, we're flawed beings. Now, that doesn't mean we stay there. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we got a green light to do it because because Christ died for it. No, we're all on this journey to optimize. We're all on this journey to be like the best version of ourselves. But that's a journey and a process. Yes. And it has nothing to do with who God is to you, right? Like, if you're concerned about your journey, be concerned about your journey because everybody here that's walking this walk is trying to do the same thing. We're trying to be who God created us to be. That's you and it's including the deacon and the pastor and his daughter and his son, mm -hmm. the PKs, like, mm -hmm. the drummer, mm -hmm. everybody. So if you go to a church and somebody say something to you that's hurtful, that somebody talks about you, hurts your feelings, does something evil to you, that's them. That's their journey. That's not God. Mm -hmm. And the more and more we confuse God with this building that we walk into, the more and more we're going to be stagnated and growing spiritually. And I know there's a relationship podcast and some people right now are like, yo, what does this have to do with the price of tea in China? Mm. But listen to me. As your spirit goes, so goes your emotions. As your emotions go, so does your relationships. Right? You can't be emotionally healthy if you're spiritually poor. There's a lot of people right now who have every amenity available to them. They're rich, they're wealthy, and they still are depressed. There's people, we just, we just, the whole world was just mourning over Twitch. Mm -hmm. Who on the outside looking in, oh man, you look, you live in your dream. You're using your gifts. It's bless you. You were on a platform for years. Your family's taken care of. Everybody is looking over social media. Like there's no way that this person could have taken their own life. Look at him. He looks happy. He's dancing. He's got his family. He just posted this a day ago. He, he just posted smiling. this a day ago. Yeah. They was on here like that's conspiracy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that is evident <laughs> that your spirit, man, your being spirit healthy, spirit is inconsequential. It like you can't ignore that part of you. Mm -hmm. Like there's no substitute for it. There's distraction, but there's no substitute. Like if you're in this life, you have to maintain your spirit. Yeah, I I you touched on the the drinking thing because you know by the time I came to myself and to God, I was I was done drinking. Like I hadn't drank consistently in years now i would say by the standard textbook definition from the age of about 15 to the age of about 23 i was an alcoholic yeah. i drank almost every day and it was sneaking in high school was just sneaking a little shot from my mom's like captain morgan's that she kept under the table before, before i went to school just because i was like oh, i gotta wake up i need this like <laughs> It's not funny um, <laughs> to like every day having something at my house when I could purchase it that I could just sip on just yeah. to relax or to go to sleep mm -hmm. or, you know what I'm saying? And I, so for about three years before <clears throat> coming, coming to church and starting my uh, spiritual journey, I hadn't drank anything literally the day after I decided, all right, I want to get saved. This is what I want to do. The next time they offer baptism, I'm going to take it. I get this craving to drink. 
Mm. Like, and then I'm going around family who continue to drink and it's being offered to me, right? Mm. Hey, you should try this, taste this. And so I'm, then I started taking sips of stuff. I've been going to church. I hadn't really, I hadn't said, I hadn't made my confession, but you know, I decided this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But now I'm being confronted with the thing that I felt like I had conquered. Yeah. And in this journey, what God was showing me is that I had conquered that in my own strength. Mm. And that was not a sustaining strength. Wow. I could may I made the decision to stop drinking, but if it was offered to me or if I didn't have a good day or, you know, if the by the little bottle, liquor bottle looked good enough, I'd take a sip. Mm -hmm. What he allowed me to see is that mm -hmm. I needed him for even the stuff that I thought I had beat, even the stuff that I thought. I was done with and I was over. And the only way that he showed me that was taking me back to that and showing that because in my strength, I couldn't conquer it. I was going to continue to fall. Mm. And he uh, pulled me in such a way that it literally took the taste of alcohol away from me. Wow. Like now when I'm offered it, I can freely say, nope, don't need that because it's not, I know it's not me. Like it's something that he told me with me and you you can't do that yeah now other people you know we have catholics and they drink and it you know it's nothing to their religion but for me yeah. i think that's a personal thing because some people say well it don't say in the bible you can't drink you just drink wine you know all these things yeah it's a personal conviction yeah and for me in the history that's in my family of alcoholism he said you know what you can't do that and the only way you're not gonna be able to do that is if you lean fully on me to deliver you from that yeah. and that's what he did for me and so when we talk about you know people in the church and messing up and things it's it's their journey and we can't judge their journey because you don't know what god has taken them through had yeah. it been somebody in my church that saw me going to buy liquor for my mom you know they could have been like oh she's still drinking she ain't changed da, 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 because they don't know what i'm going through so you don't know what somebody else, what God is taking somebody else through. Yeah. So when we put this flashlight in this lens that these people can't be flawed and can't be messed up, like that purification process, that sanctification process that God specifically takes you through one-on-one -on -one is a life-changing thing that nobody else can judge. So when you see people in church mess up, I think the best thing that you can do besides judge them or turning away from God because it's all fake is to pray for them because you have no idea what they're dealing with. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, the drinking thing is is it is close to home <clears throat> with me because I think that's it's it's one of the things that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it comes seasonally. You know what I mean? Um but it's weird. Like most of the time when you think of people struggling with alcohol, like you would think that it was something that they wrestled with for years mm -hmm. or something like they were like when I, we watched this documentary, true life, remember true life used to come on MTV, mm -hmm. true life. I'm an alcoholic. When I watched that, that, and that's the image that I have, I'm like, okay, that's a problem. <laughs> so for me who I might've had, a, I, it started off just socially. Like I never would purchase my own alcohol if I was somewhere and there was drinks. I have a drink. Maybe I might take it too far, but I ain't buying it myself. Right. And those things were far few in between. It's not like I'm going out every weekend. Then it came. It wasn't until COVID when the quarantine happened when I started purchasing my own. Like I'm just around the house. I just get you know I like a glass of what was that drink at the time it was whiskey, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like a gangster drink, <laughs> drinking whiskey at night, right? Um, but knowing that alcoholism runs in my family right it wasn't until i tried to stop when i was like oh wait no this is a craving mm -hmm. like i want to do this mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i kept trying to find a way to incorporate that into my life even after i recommitted my life to god i was the same things you were saying like i'm mm -hmm. like oh yeah no like it's jesus drunk wine you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i agree with like it's not a sin but for my personal walk and what God's doing with me, like, I just can't do that. And when I look back on my history, just when you were talking, I was reflecting, like, alcohol was one of the ways that I, like, silenced my spirit, man. Mm -hmm. And how I silenced mm -hmm. that inner voice, like, this is wrong. 
like before I was promiscuous, I always drunk. You know what I'm saying? There were girls who I would mess with. I would get tore down before I went over there. I'm driving over there drunk because I have to be that way for me to feel good. Go through with it. Cause, yeah, because yeah. I that's not really my, you know, some people can move like that, like, mm-hmm. and it's fine. I can't. So I would have to, you know, shut down that part of me. Or um smoking. Like sometimes I like want to hype myself with the smoke weed, but I know I'm not gonna make that decision. But when I'm drunk. You know what I mean? I try a little bit of everything. All right, here we go. Oh, you got some edibles? Okay, what we doing? You know what I'm saying? So, um, once again, it's about just knowing your walk, listening to, and the more you get in touch with your spirit, man, that voice, that conviction, that, like, just feeling internally of this is wrong, it'll tell you what's for you and what's not. You know what I mean? Like, some people can live their life. They drink wine with dinner. They fine, and their relationship is restricted. They're good. But you can feel when something is not for you. And I definitely um, was feeling that. Like, okay, this is different. <laughs> yeah, no. I, you know, God specifically told me, like, I can't I can't go buy it for people. Or when, you know, people make infused cakes. If, y'all don't know, I'm a baker. Mm. And I would have customers come to me mm. at my brokest. You hear me? At my brokest. Like, can you make me a Patron cake with the little bottles on top of it? <laughs> and I had to say no. You know, yeah. that was so hard for me. It's difficult, Because yeah. I'm like, I have to feed my kids. Yeah. But God told me I can't, like, I can't mess with alcohol like that because mm-hmm. I know it's a trigger for me. Yeah. And it was it was difficult. And I think the the internal struggle that we feel when we make the decision is also a lot of times what pushes people away. Because we think that when we make the decision to follow Christ, that it's all going to be good from that moment forward. I'm never going to have any more struggles Um, what they say. All my bills going to be paid. My debt's canceled. (laughs) Checks in the mail (laughs) every day from this point on is going to be perfect. And then the moment that it doesn't happen, we're like, well, where's God? I can't see God in that. How did he let my car get towed? How did he let my mama die? How did he Mm -hmm. let me lose my job? And uh, I was doing my study time today and simple little sentence at the end of Exodus just said, um, God saw the Israelites and God knew. And it reminded me that no matter what I'm going through, right? He sees me and he knows where I'm at right now, but he also knows that like, if I just stay the course where I'm going to be. So the promise is not, ever victory or completeness and happiness every day of my life here that promise is that it's eternal right that when I leave here I get to celebrate and all that but while I'm here many are the afflictions of the righteous like we're going to go through and I think that 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 mindset is what I would like to see the shift be from prosperity gospel and prosperity teaching. Cause yes, that's going to come. Yeah. But what about the stuff that I'm not expecting? Yeah. What about the hardships that I'm going to have to face? And in my opinion, in the hardships is where God shows himself the strongest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's what's, that's where the prosperity is. It's the peace in the middle of the storm. Right. Like the storm's coming for everybody. Like, <laughs> like wherever you at, the storm is going to touch down. Mm. But it's about in the middle of the storm. How am I sitting here with peace in the whole world's going crazy? I didn't realize that until COVID. Mm. Like when everything was cool, when, when everything was smooth, like I could fake it. Like I knew I, I wasn't where I was supposed to be. But like smoking, drinking, being promiscuous, those things pacified me Mm -hmm. now when the world shut down and i don't know what the future holds when half of the population's dying off everything's closed there's no vice for me i can't even go to the liquor store and i just gotta sit with it then i remembered i remember being peaceful i remember never worrying never being stressed What is this feeling? Anxiety, anxiousness. That's never been a part of my, that's never been a part of my makeup. Mm -hmm. I've never dealt with those things. 
And if I'm being honest with myself, in my mind, I said, that'll never be me. Mm-hmm. So when I started wrestling with that stuff, I'm like, yo, what happened? When I say, when I got back in my bag with God, when I started getting to know him for myself, not just, you know, church, but relationship, mm-hmm. and that peace came, that right there. That is what makes the difference. That's where the prosperity is. It's not in how much money in my account. And don't get me wrong. Like, God cares about that stuff. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, you know, Christ said he he comes that we don't just have life, but life more abundantly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But the real abundance is in the anchor that your soul is. You know what I mean? Like, your soul is anchored in something that can't be swayed or moved. We have plenty of stuff that we go through yeah. and some transparency. It's been times when we got on here on this platform and we talk about God, but at the same time, we're like, yo, how are we going to pay this light bill mm-hmm. or how are we going to do this? Full transparency where we've invested in this platform. All of the stuff that you see here was an investment. And in doing that, right, when this microphone broke and we had to come back on that, it was by faith. Mm-hmm. It was like, hey, look, we don't know what we're going to do. And God showed up. But yeah. other stuff we needed yeah. where we was like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to break up the payments and we're going to have to put this bill over here. But it's that anchor. Like, no, we know that since we're in position, we don't got to worry about this. Yeah, I was going to emphasize on that too, that like it's very easy from the outside looking <clears throat> in to see us come here and talk about all this thing and just to assume that we're not going through anything, right? Yeah. You know, he talked about the stuff that's happening in the past, but it's present tense. Like everything is not always peachy keen, not only with money, but with our family set up, with our house, our living situation. Like, but you'll never be able to tell nah. from this because we know we have faith. We believe, we trust that it's going to get better. And even in the middle of all of that stuff, we ain't never missed a meal. Yeah. We ain't never had no shut off notice. Like we ain't never, it's, it's never come to the point where we have went without. And that's that, that's that peace. And that's that promise that being anchored and being solidified in who God is that no matter what is happening around me, yeah. God is still the same. And he still cares about me as much as he did when everything was great in my life, when everything is the pits. Yeah. And I can tell you a hundred percent for sure, for certain that I was getting money hand over fist <clears throat> 2017 2018 and into 2019 and the moment the moment that I gave my life to Christ it didn't change I was still getting money but that peace that came with knowing (sighs) God was stuff that money just couldn't provide yeah I started to be like why was I so concerned about having money when all I had to do was have peace, peace that money just be like, okay, it's good. It's extra. Yeah. It make life a little bit more easier. I tell you that. I never, I'm not going to lie. That part. But when we don't have, I still feel good. Yeah. I still feel like coming here. I still feel like calling my friends and checking on them and telling them how good God is. Yeah. It's faith. It's faith. Like, when you believe in something and it's this is something I was um I learned this morning. I didn't learn it, but I was just <laughs> solidified this it. morning. Like when you believe something, there is a corresponding action behind that belief. Mm-hmm. Right? Like the example from the lesson that I took today, uh, from Darius Daniels was you know you believe in the stop sign because when you get up on it, you stop. <laughs> Cause you believe that if you don't there could be dire consequences to you not doing that, mm-hmm. right? So when you have faith, there's a corresponding action behind that. So like present day tense, like there's no point where you just wake up and you're just like, oh, I don't worry about that anymore. No, it's a consistent every day I'm choosing God. Every day I'm choosing God, right? So for instance, like I, I, I've been smooth and for whatever reason, this Christmas season was really difficult for me. Mm-hmm. I've been feeling a strong um, urge to drink 
mm. right? And I've been fighting that mm -hmm. silently, fighting that. There's she bakes. There's this peach cobbler she does with like uh she cooks down the alcohol in uh, what's the little shooters upstairs? <laughs> the little shooters is rum. Rum. So there's these little <laughs> rum shooters upstairs that she uses for her peach cobbler reduction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, they've been there. As long as I've been around for what the last two years, they've been there. Never, ever once did I even notice them. I forget they're there. Mm -hmm. And two weeks ago, I was very aware that they were there. Mm. Thinking they just sitting there. <laughs> it's just one little like I'm talking to myself and I'm telling myself, no, like, why is this tempting you? Mm -hmm. Why out of all this time? Why? Why now? You know what I mean? Like, why now is this something that's tempting you? What does it mean to you? Right? Like, where I have to bring my thoughts under subjection and bring them all under, uh, what's the scripture you'd be rattling off? I don't want to, I don't want to jack it up and put them on words. I want it to be like the official drink. What is it? Bring every thought into, uh, I can't say it like that. I got to say, Second Corinthians 10, yep. 3, uh, for we wrestle not against it's flesh, and, flesh blood. and blood, but against uh, Principal. principalities and Oh, I can't say uh, it now. You guys do put me on the spot. Damn, my bad. But essentially, <laughs> bring what, every thought into captivity and make every thought obedience to Christ or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so it's, pretty much bring so every thought because you can't control <laughs> what thoughts come to your mind. Like and sometimes I, I thoughts just. Them. I've got to say it. I right, say it. For though we walk in the <laughs> flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For our, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but the mighty through, through God, God, through the pulling, pulling down, down of strongholds, strongholds uh, bringing um, every thought, thought into captivity, into and making it obedient to Christ. Yeah, like something in that form. Yes, essentially. <laughs> so there's there's a a famous theologian who says you can't control when a bird lands on your head. But you can't control whether or not you let it build a nest. And that's like that same idea, right? Like sometimes you could just be minding your business and a thought just pop into your head. But when those thoughts come into your head, right? Because I have faith and I believe something about what God's doing in my life. There's a corresponding action behind that. So even when I'm tempted to do something, the works, faith without works is dead. It's the works that it produces in my life that yields the results of what I want. So even in the middle of a storm, right, where I'm going through something, uh, it might be financial stuff, it might be emotional stuff, whatever it is, right? It's that faith. It's the faith of what I'm going through, right? The facts are what God says about anything. My faith says whatever God says about something is what it is. But the truth of the matter is what messes up a lot of us up is our experience sometimes doesn't match what what we read about what God said. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But the thing between that that helps us connect our experience to what God said is the faith. So if God says that he comes out to have life and life more abundantly, even though I'm not experiencing abundance now, right now, what my faith says is that I will and he's able. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so. I want y'all to know that one nothing but the devil that stole that thought from me because I literally quote that scripture every single day. I put that pressure and on then, you. You folded it. <laughs> How? I just rattled it I'm off just the other day. With you. I'm with you. you definitely did. It literally just robbed the complete thought from my head. But yeah, no, I second that absolutely. And it, this this journey has not been like it ain't for the week. Like if you are somebody who is easily swayed or dissuade or easily fold under pressure it it ain't for you check yourself first before you try to come and, and, and walk this walk because what God takes you through is all with purpose and intention and if it was all roses it's just like those kids who you, we say if their college is all paid for then they don't appreciate it like the uh, person who has to work mm. to pay and take out loans they don't appreciate that same learning <clears throat> like if if your life was only roses it's easy to believe God if, if it's all good but when it gets hard and he has to make himself real to you when you have to know him as Jehovah Jireh, the uh, the provider, but you have can't say one time where he's provided for you. It it makes it hard to believe. But when God makes himself real, when you are down to your last and you don't know where it's going to come from, and then out of the blue, somebody just drops money in your lap 
or you your uh, account which you thought was negative it now has a positive balance and you can go buy food all things that have happened to me that I know I know for a fact was only God. There have been times where we're like, what are we going to eat for dinner in the cash app ring off just like that? Am I lying? No, absolutely. <laughs> You'll be like, okay, God, I see you. <laughs> absolutely. I remember there was this one time I was working, this is in college, I was working at Target and I just had no money. And I said, you know what, God, I'm just going to fast because if I'm going to be hungry, I'm going to be hungry with purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but fast today I'm gonna call it a fast And I forget I was working a cash register And this random woman Was just staring at me so hard Burning a hole through the back of my head She's staring at me so hard And I'm just sitting there Trying to ring up the stuff Not make eye contact I said this woman Outside of her mind And she paid for her stuff She walked away and came back and Said I'm sorry I can't fight this I clearly hearing God tell me To give you some money And she gave me $20 College that was rich yeah, You know what I mean Ramen yeah. noodles I bought from Target that day <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's like I've seen the evidence for myself Like Absolutely. he's been such a real uh, presence in all of our lives So um, I know this is a, a, a Don't v do that You don't know what I'm about to do <laughs> I know this is a VR from our usual uh, conversation on this podcast But you need to know that we believe Without a shadow of a doubt That any area of your life Without God Will not produce the fruit That it needs to produce And we've said it a million times over before But had not God been Ever so present in both of our lives We know that this relationship Would not be What it is today We would be Bobby and Whitney Because we Both know where we're flawed and we both know that without the understanding that God has to be the head of our family, that we will fail and we will falter. So when we talk to y'all about every aspect of relationship that we've been through and how we've seen redemption in every single area, it's only because we let God lead us. That part, um, this platform, uh, I know we talk about relationships um, but never get it twisted Never get it twisted The only reason we're here is because of God And as long as uh, We got breath in our body You will hear that sentiment echoed Across everything we do Because uh, it's just that important And it's that consequential so And it's if, only by his grace Yeah. So if there was anything ever you've heard us say or do That you were like yo this is dope We can't tell you how many times we see across platforms Yo this is the type of relationship I want Yo I wish I could have this. I'm praying for this. I want this. You need to know that this comes through God and God alone, right? You don't get a relationship like this absent of a faith like this. So, um, yeah, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. <laughs> uh, we want to hear from you guys. We'll be live as always tomorrow. Um, so ring off. Let us know what you think. We'll be discussing this, mulling through this uh, throughout the live. And we want to hear from you. Yes. Always <laughs> remember, we love love. <laughs> Y'all should love love too. Peace. Peace.